Hello and welcome back to another episode here on the Pilgrim's Well. My name is Paul van Engelenhoven. I'm here with my dear brother, Paul Smalley. You're most welcome. Thank you, brother. We um, are going to speak about uh, communion with the triune God today. Um, topics such as prayer, uh, the word, uh, but also the reality of always being in the presence of God. Um, if you have any comments, uh, please join the discussion below this video and uh, let's get started. Well, uh, brother, I want to um, go back to this book. You've written many other books uh, together with Dr. Beeky right. um, and, and uh, to, to feed the flock. If, if that, is that right? That's, uh, oh, yeah. You're writing to support and strengthen yes. the church? It's for the church and also for those that God will add to the church, God willing. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So um, you might be familiar, we talked about this last time about Reformed Systematic Theology. Uh, I have heard um, through the grapevine that uh, you are editing the last volume right. of this. So there's three out now, one is still to come. What's the last one about? Uh, it's on the doctrines of ecclesiology, which is the mm -hmm. doctrine of the church, and eschatology, which is last things, the second coming of our Lord. Yeah. Maybe since COVID, maybe a little bit before, but I think there's a lot of interest in eschatology mm. where people feel that things are coming to an end or, or simply long for the, for the return of Christ. So right. uh, highly recommended to dive into that. I haven't read it, but I have seen uh, the first three volumes and um, it's, it's been a wonderful experience. When you read it, I think you'll taste the same. Um, it is to worship God with your mind. Right? You learn things, and, and it's, right. it's careful consideration, uh, but also with your heart. Yes. It's stirring up the heart, um, and then, and then a, in a practical application as well. So it's, uh, mm -hmm. it's really, I would see it, uh, this is not the Bible, but it's a companion to help us understand right. uh, the Bible better in, in different ways. So I want to talk about communion with God today. And uh, as we talked about it earlier this week and prepped for this, uh, who is sufficient for these oh, things, yeah. right? Who can say the final word? But I, I was thinking, let's let's jump in with a sentence that I was reading a couple of weeks ago that really stirred up my heart. Um, and it's a short sentence. And listen, this is what it says. It's on page 150 of the first volume. In the middle of the page, it says, whenever we speak about God, God listens with open ears to hear whether we honor him. Uh, that's not speaking about prayer directly. Right. Um, it's speaking about um, speaking about God. But what struck me is the presence of God, not just when we pray mm -hmm. um, or when we read, but always. Mm. Um, and so uh, would you be able to give us um, a general introduction to how do we relate to God? What is communion with God? Mm. Mm. Well, first of all, I think the way that you have laid this out as a foundation for what we're going to talk about is very helpful because we're talking about communion with God. In part, we're talking about simply acknowledging what is already real, mm -hmm. and that is that God is there, mm -hmm. that God is, is, that he is, that he exists, and he is present and at work in every part of our lives. Mm -hmm. And so communion with God isn't, you know, something you go up to a mountain to find God. Mm -hmm. um, communion with God is beginning with recognizing that he is God. He is already there. He is already involved. Mm -hmm. um, and, of course, communion with God requires that we have a reconciled relationship with him. Mm. Can you explain that a little bit? Certainly. God is good, and he is good to all that he has created, but we are not good. We have sinned against God in many ways. That has violated his law. It has dishonored his holy name. Mm. It's broken the relationship that we were created to have with God. Mm. So if we're going to talk about having a, a right relationship with God, it has to start with coming close to him through Jesus Christ. Mm. Christ, his son, um, the second person of the Trinity, who became a man, who died on the cross for the sins of his people, who rose again from the dead, and who even now is at work in the world through his word mm. to bring people back to God. Actually at work in the world. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Mm. Whenever the gospel is preached, Christ is preaching. Mm. He's calling people to peace with him. Wow. So uh, whenever the people of God meet together, even if it's a very small gathering, Christ says, there am I also. Mm. 
So communion with God is always through Christ, and it always involves, first and foremost, getting right with God, having our sins forgiven by the shed blood of Jesus, um, entering into that life that God has for, uh, for undeserving sinners. Mm. Yeah. So, so if we think about this, if we talk about communion, and especially before we go for, from our parts, for, if, if we look at the aspect of God's communion towards us, what is the difference between um, a man who has not been reconciled to God, so, so right. one who has not believed in Jesus Christ and to salvation, um, and then how is that different, the way that God deals with us and, and works towards us, to a person who has come to Christ? Because obviously God is present in both our lives. Uh, right. He is as much in the world of the unbeliever as the believer. Right. Uh, from God's perspective or, or, or from our perspective of God with God, how does he relate differently? That's an excellent question. Um, so as I mentioned before, God, God is good to all that he has created. Mm -hmm. It says that in many places in scripture. And so God continues to be kind and to do good even mm -hmm. to those who do not acknowledge him. Mm -hmm. But um, it is not true to say that we are all God's children. Mm -hmm. Um, because even though, yes, in a general sense, as the creator of the human race, mm -hmm. we are his offspring in a sense. Yeah. Um, through Adam. Through, yeah, yeah, through Adam, exactly. But that relationship between us and God, that father-child relationship has been broken by our sin. Mm. So for the unbeliever, um, and uh, I say this as one who once was in mm -hmm. this state, um, from God's side, even though he continues to be kind, um, God's attitude towards that person is one of wrath. Mm. God is angry against his sins. Mm. Um, God is a just and righteous God, and though he, he does not take pleasure in anyone's suffering per se, mm. he does take pleasure in the execution of justice in making things right. Mm. And so right now that person is viewed by God as an enemy of God. Um, mm. So you find that, for example, in uh, Ephesians chapter 5, where Paul talks about how that for on account of these things, he had just listed a bunch of sins, the wrath of God mm. is coming upon the sons of disobedience, which is kind of a Hebrew way of saying people whose lives are characterized by disobedience. Wow. And from the human side, um, that person who is yet in a state of sin, even though there are ways in which he knows about God because all creation witnesses to God's existence. And maybe this person has a Bible or at least has heard some things about the Bible. Mm. He doesn't know God. Um, and he doesn't love God. Oh. And so both from God's side and yeah. from his side, there, there is no communion mm. that is possible mm. because they stand opposed to each other. Yeah, so they're... If you look at it, if you stand with, with your father and, and with an enemy, you're both in front of each other, mm -hmm. but between you and your father, if, you, if it's a loving relationship, there is a joy. And with you and your enemy, you're just as close, perhaps, um, but there is antagonism right. um, and, and wrath. Uh, I'm thinking when you spoke about that passage in Ephesians, um, about the, the passage in Romans where it says, you're storing up wrath mm. until the day of wrath. Yeah, right. The righteous Where, judgment of God. Yeah, the nearness of God is a frightening reality for unbelievers. Yes. Uh, because we are just as close, and whereas um, as, as a beloved child of God, as a Christian, you're storing up uh, joy and, and, and love to the Father. Right? He rejoices in us, even though mm -hmm. none of us are perfect. Right. Um, but if you're an enemy of God, you are storing up anger. I, I'm thinking of, I think it's in Jonah, where the, in the Hebrew it says um, that God has a very long nose. He's uh, long-suffering. Right? Yeah. And, and the idea is, yeah. is when you get angry, your, your face becomes red, mm -hmm. but the last part that is red is the tip of your nose. Right? It, so it takes a long time for him uh, to become angry. Mm -hmm. And yet, uh, if I put that together with Romans, uh, until you're reconciled to God, the anger of God is building. Right? The face of God is becoming, as a picture, you know, not a literal physical face. Every single yeah. day that they refuse to repent, every single minute that they continue in their sins, they are adding 
to what God's justice will require of them yeah. on the last day. They're adding to the punishment that they deserve. Um, that's why it's so urgent that people repent. Yeah, yeah. Save yourself from this wicked generation. Right. Right. It's, right. it's amazing how um, the gospel has become, in time, uh, wrongly so, uh, you know, a plan. You know, this is a wonderful invitation. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. But it's also a call to run to God. Flee from the wrath to yes. come. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. This is a. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, I'm thankful for for laying that out. What does the gospel change? So, if we if we mm. depict this uh, in our small human understanding, mm -hmm. and we see God. The, the wrath of God storing up or building up mm -hmm. towards the unbeliever. Mm -hmm. What does Christ change when we, when we believe in Christ and are reconciled to God? Yes, uh, that's, a, that's a crucial question. Let me just read a couple of verses from Jeremiah 32. This is a summary of the work that God is promising to do um, to make those who have been his people in kind of an external way to become truly his people in what we would call a new covenant way. Yes. Um, in Jeremiah 32, I'll just read verses uh, 39 and 40. It says, I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for their own good and the good of their children after them. And I will make with them an everlasting covenant that I will not turn away from doing good to them. And I will put the fear of me in their hearts that they may not turn from me. And so there's, there's two sides to this promise, both of which were accomplished through Christ. Mm. He's the mediator of the new covenant. Um, and this promise in Jeremiah 32 connects back in with the promise in Jeremiah 31 of the yes. new covenant, as you know well. Um, and so one side of it is, is on God's side. God says... I'm going to make a covenant with them. In other words, I'm going to bind myself to them through a solemn promise, and I will not stop doing good to them. Mm. I'll never turn away from them. Yeah. And so God's own a relationship with them is changed so that the wrath is fully taken away. Mm. And Jeremiah doesn't explain this here, but of course that's through the finished work of Christ, bearing that wrath on the cross. Yeah. He's our propitiation. He's our mm. sacrifice. The covenant in my blood. The covenant in my blood, yes. right. It's through his death. Mm. He pays the ransom price, and so that God's wrath is turned away, and now God becomes the reconciled father of his people. Yeah. And no matter what happens, he will not stop loving them and doing them good. That's amazing. Isn't that? Because That's we still amazing. sin. Yeah. We still sin. We still do things that break his commandments. Mm -hmm. But his relationship with us is settled. I mean, it's amazing if a human being would, would be this to us. Yeah. Right? That no matter what, I'm going to love you. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, it's, that's hard to find even on this earth. Yeah. Perhaps only in, in a family, family relationship, mm -hmm. right, where there's always a, a way back. Right. Um, but then I was reading, um, I'm reading a little bit of a different translation, but in verse 41, he continues, I will rejoice mm. in doing them good. I will plant them in this land in faithfulness. Yes. And then this, with all my heart and all my soul. Mm. I mean, <laughs> this we're talking about the... The, majest the, the majesty of eternity. Right. right? The eternal God yeah. will, will rejoice and, and plant them um, in this land of faithfulness mm -hmm. with all my heart and all my soul. Right. I mean, it's, it's amazing because I think, you know, we often struggle with this because we look at ourselves and we, and we say, you know, I, I, I see that Christ uh, died for me so I can go to heaven. But, but I'm only living on the fringes of God's love because right. I know myself and, and I, I cannot even love myself right. with my whole heart. I know God being a righteous God. Mm -hmm. He cannot love me with all his heart. Right. Uh, there must be some love towards me that, that he lets me slip in the back door. Right. And he knows that he allows me. He kind of tolerates us. Yeah, he puts up with us. But, yeah. but here it says... With all my heart and all my soul. So it's the wonderful? center of his desire. Yeah. 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 Because the only thing, I mean, God is infinitely good. Mm. 
he is light, in him there is no darkness. And so the only thing that holds back the infinite riches of his love is the guilt of sin. Yes. Um, and when the guilt of sin is taken away, that whole, that whole wall that was there, mm. that whole division that was there is gone. Yeah. And yeah. since we're fully forgiven, he has forgiven us of all our trespasses through the blood of Christ. All that is left in God is his infinite heart of love. Yeah. It's incredible. That's, yeah. yeah. It's amazing because that is the heart of God, mm -hmm. right? Uh, uh, yeah. He loves his creation. Yeah. And I, I'm thinking about uh, I, last Thursday night in our house, we were talking about scripture and um, we were talking about Hebrews. And there it says that a high priest is there to take, to sacrifice for the sins of the people. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking on other religions because in other religions, you have this idea of appeasing God or, or bringing some sacrifice so that God is kind of motivated to then bless the people. Right. Right. If you think about uh, Baal in, 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 the, in the Old Testament, sure. that was the idea. You bring him, you're sacrificing, sometimes even you're like Moloch, like you sac sacrifice your child and then... You know, these, these gods would really, okay, right. well, now you got my attention. I'll bless you. But that's never the case with God. Mm. Right? With God, he, he stands ready to bless, but our offenses have made us an enemy. Right. But once those offenses are taken away, mm -hmm. uh, there's not something like, you need to give me some and then I'll respond. It's the, it's the fullness of his love yeah. that comes towards us. Yeah, it's, it's like this, this dam that is holding back all the all the warm, sweet waters of his love. But when, the, um, when Christ pays that price, the, the floodgates are open and it whoosh. It's the, the, the infinite fullness of his goodness is going to be showered upon us. Like, like Paul says in Ephesians 2, 7, that, that God has raised us up in Christ so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace to us in mm. kindness. Yes. So Christ died and rose again so that God could spend all eternity showing us how much he loves us. Yeah. Uh, if you're watching and uh, you have questions about this or you want to speak about this, uh, feel free to leave some comments below. But uh, brother, I want to join now and, and we have one God. Yes. But there's the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, one God, and yet three uh, persons right. in the Godhead. Right. Um, my first, one of my first, I think my first book of the Puritans in a, in a generic sense was John Owen, Communion with the Tri Triune God. I think it was by Kapich or he has a, a separate volume. Right. Um, and it was, it's one of those books. If you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. Uh, don't think you're going to read it through in a week. Because uh, you might go through the letters in a week, but you haven't read it. Um, this is this is a book that I would read one page at a time and then be just so... I had to sit down and think about this. That's a deep um, book. It's, yeah. it's a wonderful book. Um, and in that, he is he's not denying the Trinity at all, but he is explaining how we relate to the triune God, or how we have communion with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, in specific, and not in, you know, when we have communion with the Father, it's not like the Son and the Spirit are somewhere else. Right. And yet we relate with the Father, the Son, and the Spirit differently. So how, how would you explain, um, let's begin with the Father. How would we relate to God the Father um, predominantly? Okay. I'm going to read what I think Owen uses as his key text in that treatise, in that 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 14. It's a blessing at the end of his epistle where he says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting because in this text, each person of the Trinity is mentioned yeah. and yet in a slightly different way. Mm -hmm. And so we can see here that there is an aspect to the way that we fellowship with the Father, since he is, though they are one God, he is a distinct person within mm -hmm. the Godhead, as opposed to, or not opposed to, but distinct from the Son and the Holy Spirit. So Paul here, interestingly enough, talks about the love of God, the love of God the Father. And if, if we think about the gospel, 
Like just say John 3.16. Hmm. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, so that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Why, why did Jesus come? Hmm. Why are people saved? John 3.16 says the ultimate answer is because the Father loves us. Yes. The Father loves us. That's the mm. deepest answer. Why, why would God save any of us? Why would God save me? Mm. There, you can't go any deeper, any yeah. further than because the Father loves us. Yeah. And so it's this, this almost inconceivable and certainly incomprehensible in its fullness, and yet something we can understand, this love that the Father has that is at the root of all the things that Christ does, because the Son always does what he sees his Father doing. Yes. Yeah. Um, and the Spirit, of course, is sent from the Father and the Son, and so he comes to glorify the Son. And so all, of, all that the Trinity does as a whole originates in the Father's love. Mm. And so when we talk about communion with the Father, what we're doing is we are knowing his love in a way that stirs within us an answering love. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I think that this is a, a topic that is often misunderstood. I'm thinking specifically about people who come out of Catholicism um, where, where God the Father is angry, but then the Son is, is more approachable because he came man, and then you have perhaps Mary who understands this even more? So you go to Mary, Mary then goes to Jesus, and then Jesus goes to, to the Father. Um, but Scripture really turns that upside down. The reason mm. why Mary could love is because God is love, mm. because the Father is love. Um, and I think that we need to begin to learn uh, more and more that it is the Father's love that sent the Son. Yes. All right? It is the yeah. Father's heart's desire that if you're a Christian today, that one day on that day, uh, you would be saved by his, his son, who is in complete agreement with the love of the father, who then by the spirit works that regenerating heart mm. in you because the father's love has been calling throughout, through the ages to that day into your ear because he loves you. Right. I, I'm, yeah. I mean, the, the love of the Father, I think often we have an understanding of Jesus Christ because we see him very clearly described in the Gospels. Right. Um, but we have a sense of, of the Father as, well, it depends what day you might meet him because we see him in the Old Testament. Um, and, and often people understand, you know, Yahweh to be the Father, but many times it's Christ as well. Right. Uh, but they see the fa they see the Father in the Old Testament as an angry God, and then the New Testament as Jesus Christ as a loving God, and so they're they're hoping that Jesus' love is enough to make them acceptable before the Father. But right. that's not at all no. the case because no. the Father loves his his people. Yeah, yeah, he he does. He does. The Son is the image of the Father. Yeah. And so whenever Jesus says, "If you, he who sees me sees the Father. Mm. So if you look at Jesus and say, wow, he's so kind, he's so compassionate, you're seeing the Father. Yeah. Um, Paul oh, in, uh, in Ephesians 1 verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing, that's the work mm. of the Holy Spirit, in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, and so on and so forth. And so the Father's love is at the root of his all. The Father's will to bless us, and not a little, mm. but to bless us with every blessing that the Holy Spirit brings. Mm. And so our communion with the Father is, is trusting that he really is as good as he says he is, yeah. and that, of course, evokes within our own hearts, well, we love because he first loved us, so we yeah. love him in return. Yeah. And it's not easy for us to do this. We, um, trusting is such a simple thing, but it's one of the hardest things mm -hmm. in the world to do. Yeah, it, it's really faith, isn't it? Yeah. It's, uh, and I think this is, um, I think there might be a, a slight misconception nowadays of being closer to God. Uh, people often place it in the emotions. 
Right. And, and emotions are part of the Christian life, right? For I mean, sure. Um, enough Jonathan Edwards to, to not dismiss uh, emotions at that time. But emotions are part of who we are. But it's not a stirring up of emotions to understand the love of the Father. Right? The love of the Father is understood by faith. And faith is increasing through the Word of God. Right. Uh, and, and we need the Spirit to help us understand and, and cr- for Christ to teach us into our hearts uh, the truth of God. Yeah. But it's really, um, and, and we talked about this with Dr. Neely in our previous interview, um, and he explained that the, the foundation of our faith must be the knowledge of God's Word. If we don't have a knowledge of God right. uh, and His Word, there's never a, an experience that can follow because it's grounded in that. Mm-hmm. And I think for people to understand the love of God, it it really requires a more careful reading of Scripture to understand who He really is. Yes. Um, w- would you be able to, um, and we're getting to the Son next, but would you be able to give us some practical pointers perhaps of how we can increase our, that trust mm. and faith in, mm. in the love of mm. the Father and knowing the Father? How, like um, in, your, in your own life, how, how do you grow over the years? So, so I think about Paul's statement in Romans 8 and verse 15. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Mm. And so on the one hand, the spirit of slavery is an option for the Christian. Mm. It's not a God-given option in the sense that he doesn't want us to do that, but Paul warns us against it here. And so it is possible to be a Christian who is in bondage and who's very fearful and we need to be aware of that, and we need to we need to fight against that. Hmm. Um, and he talks about the work of the Holy Spirit as the spirit of adoption as sons. And then he says, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. And it's very interesting that Paul goes here, and he's talking about the Holy Spirit and his work in relation to adoption. He goes straight to prayer. Yeah. So I, I think that a life of communion with the Father is very much a life of prayer prayer. Mm. And it is learning to cry out to the Father. And that word cry is that's a that's a scream for help. Mm. That's the daddy, you know, you've the mm. child's hurt, the child's scared. Mm. Daddy, I you know, I need your help. Mm. And so this is in the context of suffering. Paul's talking about suffering in verse 18 and following. Um so one of the one of the things on that tests our trust in the Father is is the pain that we go through. Mm. Because when we suffer, our natural tendency is to say, well, God must not love me or I would not be going through this. Mm. You know, I must be under the wrath of God because um, if he were with me, he would answer this. Mm. And the way that we are to commune with the Father is in the midst of those sorrows to be sending up those cries to keep praying. And to, to keep praying and laying hold of God as an Abba. Mm. Um, and that's a very striking word because, for one thing, it, it just it means Papa. Yeah. But it's also a striking word because um, it's Aramaic. Mm. Um, it's the language that the Jews commonly spoke at the time. And Paul's writing to uh, the church in Rome, which had a large Gentile population. Mm. So, and you think, why would Paul use an Aramaic word when he's writing to people who are not Jews? Well, part of it might just be because this has become the language of the church. Mm. But when you look at this word, Abba, where else does this show up in the Bible? Well, there's a parallel passage in Galatians 4, 6 that says basically the same thing. But interestingly enough, this is the very word that we find in the Gospel of Mark when the Lord Jesus Christ is crying out to God in the Garden of Gethsemane, Mm. and he's crying, Abba, Abba. Mm. It's in his darkest hour. Mm. Um, It's his greatest test. Am I going to drink of the cup of wrath? And yet it is there that he is both crying out to uh, his Abba and also submitting his will, Mm. not my will but thine be done. Mm. And so I think that, Honestly, 
The way that God brings us into deeper communion with him is he brings us into suffering, and yet his spirit stirs us in that suffering to be crying out to him. Mm. And the more we cry out to him, prayer is, is um, it's the exercise of faith. Yeah. And we're, we're saying, God, I don't understand this. God, I don't know why this is happening, but I'm trusting you. Abba, Father, help me. Yeah. And yet, not my will, but yours be done. Mm. And he's making us more like Jesus. And as he makes us more like Jesus, we come to know him in a deeper way as the Father. Mm. Trust him more, living more for his glory, knowing that he loves us even as he has ordained great sorrows in our lives. Mm. And also that he is using all this to lead us to glory. Because a child is an heir. Mm. We are the inheritors. And Paul talks about that as he goes on in Romans 8. Yeah, so that's, I think, Romans 8 gives us one window, at least. Yeah, when you were talking about that, I was thinking about Hebrews 5, verse 7, Mm. which says, In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence, right? Because of his awe or fear uh, of the Lord there. Right. Um, And yeah, the Lord Jesus Christ perhaps models what it means to grow and, and live in communion with the Father more than anything else, anyone else. Yes. Right? That, uh, to me, that you, you quoted this earlier, mm-hmm. but when Jesus says, uh, I only do what I see the Father doing. Mm-hmm. Right? And elsewhere he says that he only speaks what he hears the Father speaking. Um, I mean, that, is, that is communion with the Father. Yes. Ultimately. Right? That constant walking with the Father and... And I think we have so compartmentalized our faith life into um, a little time of perhaps with breakfast and then with lunch and with dinner, Mm. and maybe a little devotion before I go to bed. Uh, But the communion with the Father that Jesus models is a continuous conversation with our Father. To pray continuously does not mean that you're always in your prayer room and you never eat or work. Uh, But it does... Um, but it's closer to that than what we sometimes do, hmm. right? It is hmm. a con- like whatever you're doing, you're in constant communication with the Father right. in prayer. Right. Yeah, so, Well, brother, I want to take a, a short break. And for you, we'll see you next time in a couple of days when this next video will be uploaded. We're going to look uh, next time at communion with the Son and communion with the Holy Spirit. And I think that last one, there is sort of a revival of interest Hmm. uh, in that at at this time. So we'll look into that, but we'll see you next time. Uh, Don't forget to like and subscribe and leave your comments in the uh, comment section. Thank you so much. See you next time.